Hey guys, the 2014-2015 trade deadline is in the past and this is one of the busier ones on record. Uh, thanks for joining us for another Fill in the Trade with myself, Phil Wello, and fellow Hoops Lounge correspondent Justin Rowan. We have a lot of trades to go through today, so we're going to give our quick little responses on each to kind of get you guys caught up. Uh, the first one will go by the, depends how you look at it, feel good story with Kevin Garnett returning back to Minnesota for Thaddeus Young. Now, Justin, I know a lot of Minnesota fans remember the big ticket from his early days coming in at 17 years old, making a ton of money, but not really producing many results. Um, just quickly, why does Minnesota make this deal? Well, I mean, I think the main reason they made the decision was for the storyline so that he could finish his career in Minnesota. But at the end of the day, Thad Young was kind of a sunk cost. They wasted a first-round pick on him, and he was going to leave in the summer anyways. So they traded him for Garnett. He gets to mentor Andrew Wiggins. He's apparently going to be sticking around beyond this year as well. He's been rumored to sign a two-year extension. Um, so he he becomes that mentor for those guys, and maybe he's someone that can put a fire into both Anthony Bennett and Andrew Wiggins, who they've vocally said needs to establish himself a little more, be a better leader, uh, communicate more, and be more aggressive. So I guess they're hoping that he can bring that to the team. So essentially his role is a little bit more mentor, player, coach than actually what he's going to bring himself on the basketball court in this, at, at this point of his career. And, and uh, to that point, I think he can add some uh, mentorship to uh, Diang as well, a young power forward center who I think uh, could, could do with a little bit more of a focus. Some people say, you know, his game is not as consistent. And, you know, if you can add that intensity to Bennett and Wiggins, uh, you know, with Wiggins, especially his skill set, what he's shown now, imagine that KG intensity in the fire. Yeah, Could absolutely. I think you raised good points there. Perfect. Well, uh, the next one here uh, that was brought up, uh, Goran Dragic and his brother Zoran Dragic, who, uh, it's funny how, how, how Phoenix is in, is in love with the brothers these days. Um, making his way uh, from Phoenix to Miami, essentially uh, Danny Granger, a couple first-round picks, John Sammons, and some other pieces, Norris Cole moving around. Um, what would you think of this on both sides? I mean, first, maybe let's talk on the Phoenix side. Um, we heard that because of Isaiah Thomas being locked up, Eric Bledsoe, he wanted, it, he, he wanted out. Uh, do you think they made the right decision moving him now, or do you think they were, would have been wiser to keep him make that playoff run, and maybe try to play the PR game and keep them long term? Um, I, I think they definitely made the smartest decision possible. I, I don't think they were going to make the playoffs. Uh, OKC was kind of nipping at their heels and is right there uh, competing for that eighth seed, and I'd say they're the favorite to get that seed. Dragic wanted out no matter what, and his comments at the trade deadline were that he no longer trusts management. He was going to leave no matter what. So the fact that they may have came away with an upgrade in Brandon Knight, who certainly hasn't been as good of a player to this point, but he's younger and might fit better with uh, Eric Bledsoe, that kind of makes me think that they did make the right decision. It's a bit of a shame that they had to give up Tyler Ennis as well, but overall I think they came away with a pretty good trade deadline. Absolutely. Well, we will touch on that Bucks trade in a second. Um, I mean, this is kind of bittersweet for Miami, right? Because a lot of people are saying they got the coup of the whole uh, trade deadline, uh, landing a arguably top 15 player in Goran Dragic, who's a third-team All-NBA, uh, but then also losing Chris Bosh uh, to what's now blood clot in his lungs. Um, obviously, we wish Bosh a speedy recovery. This is not something that anyone wants to deal with, and uh, it can be pretty scary. Uh, I mean, with him, I, th I, I don't think anyone, anyone would have argued that they would have been in contention. I think that starting five, especially with the ascension of Hassan Whiteside, would have been there. Now, just quickly, do you still think that Miami has a chance to poke around and make some noise, considering they still have Dragic, Wade, Deng, uh, and Whiteside, and uh, I guess Mick Roberts at this point? Or do you think it's uh, uh, Bosch was the linchpin and losing him is the season? I really think they're in a lot of trouble. Uh, Bosch was probably their second best player uh, through the, throughout the at least the last two years of the big three being together. Uh, and a, a lot of what he creates is those cutting lanes for Dwayne Wade and those other players. He creates space for Whiteside. Now they really only have one legitimate big that teams can key in on. 
and we don't know how healthy Dwayne Wade's going to be. He's out right now as well, which puts Miami in jeopardy of even missing playoffs at this point. Uh, they're sitting in the eighth seed. Bosch is done for the season. Wade might be out for a while. Dragic is going to take some time to uh, get used to playing with the team. And they really have no bench. I mean, outside of Mario Chalmers and Shabazz Napier, they traded away their entire bench to get Dragic. So the short-term and long-term outlook doesn't look that great for Miami, especially when you hear Dragic is already bringing up how great of a fit he would be with the Lakers. So it's it's a bit of a concerning situation for them. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a especially scary news considering you gave up two first-round draft picks. I think the idea was they were really banking on the ability to sign Dragic after this year uh, to continue with that aging staff. Um you know, that's how the cookie crumbles in the NBA. We'll have to cover that. Now, uh, one of the more exciting te- uh, trades, and one that left some people scratching their heads, uh, how Phoenix acquired Brandon Knight and Kendall Marshall, and Michael Carter-Williams, former uh, Rookie of the Year, has made his way to uh, Milwaukee, where a coach kid is apparently really, really excited to coach this guy. And Philadelphia uh, acquires uh, another asset, as they always seem to do, it's that top five protected pick from the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, just quickly, um, why do you think Phoenix and uh, Milwaukee and Philly do the do these trades? I mean, it seems you know like they had what they would have deemed their point guard in the future in Carter Williams, but maybe some people around the league aren't believing the hype as much. Maybe it was that high-powered system that was boosting his value. Do you think they were trading high, or do you think they gave up on him? I think they sold high. I was of the opinion that they needed to trade him in the summer, right after he won Rookie of the Year. You look at who um, Milwaukee gave up in Brandon Knight. He's the same age as Michael Carter Williams. Carter Williams is a fairly old player. He's a poor shooter. Uh, He's a poor finisher from in close. He turns the ball over. He's not a good defender, even though he gets steals. Those are primarily a result of playing in the passing lanes, almost Monte Ellis and Golden State-type defense. So I thought uh, Philadelphia coming away with the Lakers' first-round pick is a huge coup for them. Uh, I didn't understand the other trade they made, but... Uh, really, for Milwaukee, giving up Brandon Knight, I, I'm not really comfortable with that. But they did also get a good prospect in Tyler Ennis, and they did get um, Mason Plumlee as well. So that gives them depth with losing Larry Sanders, and it gives them two point guard prospects, which, like you said, Jason Kidd is very high on Michael Carter-Williams, so it's very possible that he thinks that he can get the most out of him. But uh, right now I'm skeptical of the trade. Well, they did uh, definitely bring in a Plumlee. Uh, uh, this one was Miles of Mason being in uh, Brooklyn oh, there. Right. Um, I think it's actually interesting in Milwaukee. I actually think Ennis and Carter Williams will be able to play together um, in some lineups with Carter Williams, obviously, at 6'6", being able to cover the two. Um, I just thought it was interesting because going uh, Brandon Knight, obviously, is having a breakout year and going into restricted free agency. And maybe the consensus around the Milwaukee camp was that they didn't want to pay him the big dollars that would be necessary. Um, interesting point. I, I, I think anytime you have a point guard in a point guard driven league that can play defense and been in the skills competition, a little bit tough. I, I personally think this hurts their playoff chances. I think it's going to take a while for these new guys to acclimate and we'll really have to see if Carter Williams was a product of that system or really that good. I'm, I lean a little bit more to the system as I think most people do here. Um, but an interesting trade, uh, uh, nonetheless. And, you know, it's going to be tough to be a 76ers fan. Uh, fan. Uh, uh, the trade uh, you were alluding to before uh, was the K.J. McDaniels, I imagine, to uh, the Houston Rockets. Uh, a lot of people are pretty high on McDaniels. Uh, do you think they just gave him away? Or they, I, I think this was, was one of the rare, um, you know, miscues by Sam Hinkie there. Well, I think it was – I don't think Sam Hinkie's miscues are that rare, but that's – going to be revealed in the future. But giving up K.J. McDaniels, I mean, he was in the Rookie of the Year conversation and in the lead of the conversation until Wiggins really started to establish himself and break through. But K.J. McDaniels has been a fantastic player all season for them, probably their second-best player, and they gave him away for essentially nothing. Now, he was a restricted free agent, so maybe they thought either he didn't want to sign there or that the they'd have to match more than they were comfortable with, which I guess was fine. But they really didn't 
get a lot in return for him, and that's going to be a huge piece for the Rockets moving forward. I mean, KJ McDaniels is a perfect fit there. All of a sudden, they have depth. So Daryl Morey really came away with one of the steals of the deadline in KJ McDaniels. No, I agree. And if you, when you looked at their team last year, their ability to guard the perimeter with uh, you know, Chandler Parsons and such, you were kind of scratching your head. But now with Trevor Reza, Corey Brewer, and KJ McDaniels, it becomes very interesting. And we know defense wins championships. And it's got to be a feel-good story of the All-Star Weekend, having Patrick Beverly being the replacement, winning the skills competition uh, with James Harden obviously cheering on that. So uh, we'll see how they go. Now, the trade I really wanted to get into um, was the one between the Detroit Pistons, Oklahoma City Thunder, and the Utah Jazz. Essentially moving pieces. Reggie Jackson, one, one of my favorite players, and, and we called he was going to be moving. Uh, earlier in the year. Uh, he's going to Detroit. He's going to get the shot at having the Reigns' his own team, playing with Greg Monroe and Andre Drummond under Stan Van Gundy. Uh, Oklahoma City acquires... The, uh, this is kind of one of those trades that almost everyone, maybe not Utah, uh, wins. Ennis Cantor going to OKC, 22 years old, a center who can score. He'll provide some youth and defense and size, along with Stephen Adams, who's been struggling of late and uh, Serge Ibaka and such. Uh, they're healthy, they're big, they're deep. Uh, they also got DJ Augustine, which I think was very underrated in this trade. The ability to play that backup point guard behind Russell Westbrook, and he won't complain. He knows his role. And Kyle Singler to shoot off the wing. And Utah acquires Kendrick Perkins, uh, sure, who they're for sure going to release their buyout, uh, Grant Jarrett and the rights to Tibor Police and draft picks. So... I don't think we'll stay too long on the on what Utah got here. But when we're talking about Detroit and, o and OKC, the first question is, with Detroit, they receive Reggie Jackson. A, do you think this works? And B, do you think this potentially could push them into a playoff contention? I think what would push them into a playoff contention more so than the acquisition of Reggie Jackson is going to be the Chris Bosh injury, or I don't know if you even want to call it injury, the illness that... Bosch is missing the rest of the season as a result of. Um, Reggie Jackson, I, I don't know how great of a fit he is in a Stan Van Gundy system because he can't shoot, which is almost it's a prerequisite uh, to play the wing in one of those offenses. Um, uh, really, the big winner in this trade, I think, is Oklahoma City. They get the third overall pick in the 2011 draft in Enos Cantor, who might be the center of the future. Uh, for them. DJ Augustine, at least down the stretch run, is probably going to be a better player than Reggie Jackson, which might be a bit of a hot take there, but he at least is going to play in the role, whereas Reggie Jackson was a little bit disruptive. He wasn't shooting well. He was turning the ball over, and nobody wanted him there. So at least in terms of fit for this season, that's an upgrade for them. And then Kyle Singler, he, he was starting a shooting guard for the like, he's a good shooter. He's a big player. He, he's going to provide um, the Thunder with more depth, which was really their biggest struggle. They had three great players and no depth. So uh, I really do think Oklahoma City is the team that comes away with the big win here. Uh, I don't know what Detroit has in Reggie Jackson. I think the Reggie Jackson thing personally is very interesting because I think he, he's given the reins, given the Brandon Jennings injury, say, hey, you're a restricted free agent. Show your worth. He has the second half of the season. If he blows up and plays well, I think they sign him. I think he's going to be better than most people give him credit for. And then you have mm -hmm. Brandon Jennings on an affordable $8 million a year contract for a guy who can put up 20 and 8 to potentially get another wing guy in the offseason. And if he doesn't work out, well, uh, they let him walk, and they just keep Jennings. So I think it's a low risk for Detroit. I think it's a high ceiling for Detroit if he works out because if he can put up numbers like he was able to do – in Westbrook's absence, although it seems like almost every point guard is doing that in Van Gundy's system these days. <laughs> um, but uh, as, as, a, as a closing bit uh, uh, to that trade idea, Kendrick Perkins was the, he was kind of thrown in for salary reasons. Uh, some people saying it's, he was the big brother in that OKC locker room and, uh, you know, kept those egos in check as best you could. He's obviously going to be released and maybe picked up by... There's a few teams out there. I know you're Cleveland Cavaliers, one of them, uh, Chicago Bulls, and I've heard the Clippers, maybe a couple other teams we'll see. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking specifically for OKC, because I agree with you, I think they came away with gangbusters. You know, They just have incredible depth and youth. I mean, 
with their GM's ability to bring in both Dion Waiters, who was a fourth overall pick, and Ennis Cantor, who was a third overall pick, considering they've been at the top of the league, I think it's just genius. But do you think Kendrick Perkins' loss really hurts them? Probably more chemistry leadership-wise, but do you think this is something that they have to worry about, or do you think just the talent they brought in, the better balance now, will more than make up for that? I don't think it's something they have to worry about. Um, they have Steven Adams that's going to provide a lot of the same kind of toughness that Kendrick Perkins did. They certainly do lose something in the locker room. Uh, they don't lose anything on the court. They certainly gain there. But uh, I think they address their needs. I think they have a strong enough locker room culture. I think Kevin Durant, um, Serge Ibaka is a strong personality as well. So I, I think they're fine with locker room culture. Um, so they didn't really risk anything moving him, but what they gained, I, I agree. I, I think they address their needs perfectly, and probably if they get into the playoffs, which it looks likely, they might be a favorite to make it out of the West, even if they have to play a Golden State first round. I agree, and that's quite the uh, you know the turnaround from how they started their season. Uh, jumping into uh, another trade here, we were talking about Phoenix for a couple other point guards, but I can't end the conversation without Isaiah Thomas. Uh, I'm kind of going under the radar because, you know, let's be honest, the Boston Celtics aren't making many splashes. They're just trying to collect assets. Isaiah Thomas is now a Boston Celtic. Marcus Thornton goes to the Suns. I kind of like that. A little bit of a size and you can shoot. And Tayshaun Prince um, goes to Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, where it all began. Um do you think this has any real implications, uh, or or do maybe you agree that you know it's creating the same kind of problem they had in Phoenix now in Boston with Avery Bradley, Marcus Smart, Isaiah Thomas, or do you think this is just a shrewd move to pick up a productive young point guard on a reasonable contract by Danny Ainge? Uh, my biggest concern is now this is two teams that have dumped Isaiah Thomas despite being very productive. Sacramento dumped him, even though he's a 20-point-per-game player and very, very good on the court. It's starting to look like he's a little bit of a locker room problem, which is unfortunate with when you have other guys that are going to command a fair amount of minutes. Like you said, Avery Bradley, uh, Marcus Smart was drafted seventh overall this year. Uh, so from that aspect, it's a little bit concerning. I love Phoenix picking up Marcus Thornton. He's a perfect fit for them, size, shooting, he's able to get up and down the court. So that was a great pickup from them. But clearly they identified that Isaiah Thomas is an issue, and they just couldn't have him around. So they gave up one of their marquee signings this summer just to get him out of the locker room. It's just a bit ironic because it almost seemed like that marquee signing is what pushed Gordon, uh, Gordon Rogers out the door, but we'll see. There were, there were a couple of things about that. Like I heard Eric Bledsoe was a little ball dominant. He wants to run his own team, but we'll see how that plays out because it could be for naught if uh, Dragic is a Laker next year. Um, <laughs> One of the more unsung trades that we both agree it was has huge playoff implications. Um, the Portland Trailblazers receiving uh, Aaron Aflalo from the Denver uh, Nuggets. A couple players each way, Alonzo G. Coming back to Portland, Thomas Robinson, Will Barton, Victor Claver, and a 2016 first-round draft pick that's lottery protected going to Denver. Denver's in a bit of a weird spot, seeming to want to wholesale out their whole team, but then keep some talent. I'm a little surprised Wilson Chandler didn't make his way out. What does Aaron Aflalo add to a not-so-deep Portland Trailblazers team? Well, I think he hit the nail right on the head. Was Portland had no depth whatsoever, especially with Nick Batum playing poorly uh, this season. Aflalo is a huge pickup for them. Um, Aflalo himself isn't having a great season, but he's still a very, very productive guard that can play either shooting guard or some small forward. Um, the, Alonso G is a good pickup for them as well, who he has proved, even though his past might be a little shaky in terms of being a productive player, he was a productive six man that can play defense, get up and down the court. So they really bolstered their bench by adding two quality wings and one that might be able to fill in should Nick Batum falter. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think Aaron Aflalo, he could have started on most teams, let's be honest. And having him with uh, one of my other favorite guys, Wesley Matthews, it's just 
I feel like they're like brothers from different mothers and what they can bring to the table. Um, but, but it always assures that the wing is that they're going to have strong three and D guys all the time. And I just think it pushes them. But I mean, you really have to look at a lot of these teams in the West. This is a tight West. Now, when you look at how Portland's improved, how, uh, Houston's made his little moves, how OKC is improved now in the playoffs. And you often obviously have your top guns like Golden State and the Grizzlies and such. This is, uh, you know, people are talking about the talent of the West. I, I thought this was really funny, this whole trade deadline. Uh, as a side note, I thought there was so much talent going to the East, which I really liked. Uh, but at the same point, it almost made the West, like the Habs now have more. And those teams that were fluttering at the playoffs, the Pelicans and the Suns seeming are spurning out, but then your OKC was jumped into that eighth spot. Everyone above them has been strengthened. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit interesting. Now, sticking with the uh, uh, the Nuggets theme, just to end this guy, um, uh, the Nuggets trade Javali McGee, everyone's favorite uh, shafting a fool participant, al uh, along with a first-round draft pick, plus a uh, guy's name I'm not even going to pretend to it pronounce, um, to the 76ers. Uh, essentially, this is... Is, is the Nuggets just paying off the Sixers to take to take the salary, or do you think there's something more to this? It's to get JaVel McGee out of the locker room, which uh, I know you're ecstatic that the Sixers picked up their center of the future in JaVel McGee, um, <laughs> but it, it was just to get him out of the locker room. And at the end of the day, Masai Jerry trading the nay for JaVel McGee was... Disaster for Denver, and they had to give up a first round pick just to get him out of there. Uh, signing an asthmatic player to play in Denver with questionable work ethic was a total, total disaster. But um, they got rid of him, and I guess they can move forward now with uh, Kenneth Fareed, uh, Darrell Arthur, I believe, is still there, and uh, Yusuf Nurkic, who has been great for them so far. So I guess they're moving forward. I, like you, I was surprised that they didn't completely clean house, but they got rid of quite a few players. No, I agree. And for the uh, 76ers, again, this is them collecting assets, right? A, a, a yet another first-round pick to add to their stockpile. Uh, the, uh, the question I'll leave with uh, you with, with this one is, if the point for Denver was to get rid of Javali McGee for locker room purposes, how do you deal with that with Brett Brown and the Philadelphia organization with two budding potential superstars, Joel Embiid and Nerlens Noel? Um, I understand they can take the salary. like This puts them to the floor almost. And the only people who really lose here are the players who would have gotten payouts if they didn't make it. Yeah. Um, I've heard this idea being bounced around. Would you tell McGee just to stay home? Um, I would. <laughs> <laughs> we played last I mean, night, so obviously this is not their number one plan, but right. I don't know if I risk my young guys, and this is what they're doing, right? They're just trying to collect high draft picks and nurture them in the long-term plan, and is part of nurturing two of your best assets bringing in someone who has been known to not do that? I don't think it's a risk for Noel. I think it's a risk to have him around Embiid. Uh, I'd keep those two away from each other as as much as I could. Uh, if you had to tell me to stay home, I would certainly do that. There was a lot of talk that they were going to buy him out. Uh, that's now been reported as not going to, that's not going to be the case. So I'm really not too sure what Philly's doing there, but I guess they got a first round pick, so at the end of the day, collecting those picks and assets seems to be the only thing they're really concerned about. Maybe they're just going to trade and beat in Noel in a year or two like they did with Mark, Michael Carter-Williams. <laughs> well, I think there's also the possibility, right, that they brought uh, McGee because they're having trouble reaching that floor, right, and it guarantees a certain amount of minimum salary. Uh, so, weirdly enough, just to bring in the salary to make, you know, appease everyone, kind of bring in a marquee name, if you want to call it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, as he's, he, he's just so bad, but he, it, it it's so funny, right, because he has the physical tools to be one of the best. I mean, oh. sometimes you just see these flashes of how he can just get around the basket. He's nimble, long arms, huge hands, and you're just like, oh, just read a book, man. Like, he just... Well, yeah, he had that incredible series against the Lakers where he locked up Andrew Bynum, and, like, he looked phenomenal, and that's why he got the contract he's on. But... And that appears to be the peak of his career. 
Yeah. Um, just to close, on both sides, maybe we'll start the West first because we were kind of talking here. Um, from the trade deadline, was there any one, one team that went from maybe a good team, a contender, to like, watch out, I'd be shocked if these guys weren't in the Western Finals? Uh, I'd have to give that award to either OKC or Portland. It, it's really a toss-up. I'm not as confident in Portland in the playoffs, but I, it, see, it's tough because OKC is likely going to have to play Golden State round one, and Portland isn't nearly as complete of a team as OKC. So to pick between the two isn't really that easy. No, I agree, and I think I would pick the same two teams. Uh, uh, there's a part of me that uh, uh, that still likes, weirdly enough, the KJ McDaniels to Houston. I I I feel Houston's a bit better than some people give them credit for. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Charles Barkley has been quite critical of them over the past, but I think Daryl Morey's done a decent job. Now, in the East, I think this makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, obviously, Cleveland, having done their trades already, Chicago having a fairly set roster, Toronto, Washington standing pat. Um, does this make... Can you see any of the teams that benefited here, like maybe a Detroit or... I guess you can't call it Miami now because of the loss of Bosch, but does this turn potentially Detroit into a team that you have to look out for in the East, or are they still, you know, a couple years away considering how young they are? I, I think there is a chance that they can make it in. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't consider them to be the favorite. I think Indiana would be the favorite to kind of sneak into that eighth seed, especially with Paul George coming back in about two weeks. Um, but they have strong coaching in Stan Van Gundy. They have quality bigs. They can play defense at a high level. So it wouldn't surprise me to see them get in, but I wouldn't say it's that likely. No, that makes sense. And last question, the Milwaukee Bucks having made this trade and in the playoffs uh, without Jabari Parker, imagine if he was there. Um, mm -hmm. Does this hurt or help their playoff chances this year? Oh, they're they're an absolute lock to make the playoffs. They have seven wins more than uh, the, I believe it's the Hornets in seventh place. Yeah, it's the Hornets. They have seven wins more than them. There's only a third of the season to go. They still play great defense. They still have Giannis. They still have John Hanson. They have quality players there and depth. Um, so I I don't think they're at risk of missing the playoffs at all. I think Miami and Charlotte would be the two teams I could see falling out of the playoffs. Okay, perhaps the question uh, should have been spun a little bit more. Once they make the playoffs, do you think they would have been better off standing pat with Brandon Knight or with the team? They should have stood pat, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that makes sense. All right, guys, well, that was the breakdown of the 2014-2015 trade deadline. Myself, Phil Bolo, and my partner here, Justin Round, can be reached anytime. Please hit us up, hoopslounge.com, for lots more information. And catch us out on Twitter. Uh, we'll put all the description in the description below. So we'll catch you guys next time in the lounge.